and wanted to know what species of waterfowl were out on our local lagoons. So I bought kind of an El Cheapo binoculars and uh, took it from there. I've been birding for 34 years and um, since 1987. All right, great. Okay, uh, let's see. How about Gary and Lauren Lester, since you guys are together there? And uh, welcome. You guys are uh, down in Boonville right now, I take it, in the hotel, I believe. Yeah, correct. Cool. Bo Boonville Hotel. Nice. How is it? What a spread. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Um, yeah, Lauren and I are doing field work down Point Arena. I need to dig up some mountain beavers and and some rare plants and nice. um, and it was a, a nice day. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm just happy to be here. I've been birding since the Humboldt days and on a desert field trip in '73, and just didn't realize the bus was full of um, a bunch of wildlife students. And um, it was, it was a, a good trip to uh, drive the bus and. Uh, Learned some birds all the way down to the border at uh, Oregon Pike. Awesome. And I'm Lauren, and I've been probably looking at birds because of my parents my whole life. They weren't bird watchers, but they were naturalists, and they looked at everything. Um, and then I went to school at Evergreen, and some of you know of Steve Herman. He was my, uh, my first bird teacher, so to speak. Came to Humboldt. Um, took a community class with Ron LaValle, got introduced to birding at a different level with him and Linda, but I still was just somebody who just liked to look at birds. I didn't list birds. Um, worked with Gary and then the rest is history. Awesome. Well, thanks guys for showing up. Glad, glad you can make it. I know it was a bit of a travel today for you guys and work and stuff. So appreciate you guys being here and uh, hope you have a nice beverage in hand to relax after the long day of travel and work and stuff. <laughs> hey, there you go. Yeah. There you go. Keep rehydrated. Keep hydrated. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's go to Gary Bloomfield. Good old Gary Bloomfield here. Oh, okay. Well, nice I've been, oh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I've been birding most of my life. Well, actually, interested in birds most of my life. I didn't really start birding until I was nine. But I was, and then when I came up to Humboldt, you know, that in 1980, and so that's when I started birding in Humboldt. And, and so, yeah, one of the first things I did was, you know, I was found uh, Doc Harris, introduced myself to him, and then he sent me off to the Arcado Marsh Project, where I got my saw, got to see my first Humboldt rarity. It was a, a rough that was there. <laughs> oh, nice! What year was that when you saw? When you um, saw fall of nineteen eighty. All right, cool. That's kind of right when the marsh was just kind of really getting established, huh? Yeah, Mount Trashmore still kind of looked fresh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Still trashy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't really no, trashy. No, it, was, it was covered it, up it was, by then. Yeah, yeah, it was all yeah. capped and yeah. cool. Awesome. Right on. Well, thanks, Gary. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Mr. Slauson. Keith Slauson, the Slossonator. All right. Howdy, everybody. Glad to be here. Uh, I guess my history, I, I started paying attention to birds uh, where I grew up in Alameda and in the San Francisco Bay Area. Moved up to Humboldt in 95 to start my undergraduate at HSU in wildlife. Um, and after taking ornithology, started to take my birding efforts to a different level. And then um, being immersed in, in just the diversity of habitats and um, involved with the amazing bird watching community up here uh, have just never kind of left uh, the passion of bird watching and it continues to grow. And you, you left the county for a while too to, to do your master's and then PhD also, is that correct? Yeah, I uh, was at Oregon State um, in the early 2000s and then uh, University of Montana about five or six years ago. But most of my field work was still in California. Yeah, cool. I'm here to stay. <laughs> 
All right, cool. Uh, let's see, is Sean here yet? Anybody see Sean McAllister? I don't see him. I texted him. So hopefully he'll get the message and, and show up here. But uh, let's go to Jude. Jude Power, welcome. Thank you. So um, of this group, I probably started birding the latest of everyone. Um, I didn't bird for a long time, but my father was a birder. So he was always giving me his hand-me-down binoculars and going on walks with me when I would go to visit and showing me local things where he was. And so finally, around 1990, I decided to be a birder. So I started going on all the Audubon field trips. I was not a wildlife major, I was in education, but um, so it was Audubon and their field trips that really got me going. And then I made friends in the community and got more involved and loved it and love it to this day. Nice. Was this so, the Ar yeah, and Arcata all my Marsh? Yeah, has been in Humboldt. I'm sorry, what? Oh, I'm sorry, Jude. Uh, was that the Arcata Marsh field trips that you went on? I know, I think we talked about that before. Yeah, they were almost all Arcata Marsh field yeah. trips at the time. Occasionally there would be something more exotic, but um, so anyway, and it's all been in Humboldt. I, by the time I decided to learn how to bird, I was already living in Humboldt. So it's great. It's brought me a lot of joy and friendship in my life. And a lot of international travel too. That you've done over and years. some of that, yeah. Yeah, nice. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Um, let's see, Mr. Tony Kurz. Are you still out in the field there, buddy? Do you have any? Any puffins that you're gonna show us in the scope or anything while while you're out there or, or what's up? Yeah, I'm not here at Point St. George. <laughs> um, no puffins yet. I did find a nice group of rhinoceros auklet um, oh, that nice. are right next to the rock. So they're super cool. But um, <clears throat> yeah, I kind of started birding in 2007 as a birder, I kind of had a love for raptors before then. And um, actually similar to Jude, it was Audubon Christmas bird count, the Springville count I got invited to go to. And I realized that all the little birds weren't all just chickadees. I used to call everything chickadees, even a white crowned sparrow in the yard. Um, so yeah, I kind of got the bird bug in like 2006. Um, and then I moved up to Humboldt in 2009 and Ken Burton was probably one of the first birders I went with out at uh, the refuge. And I was like, oh, I found a shrike. Um, and he's like, really? I said, yeah, it's a no longer head shrike. And he's like, oh, those are super rare. You know, like actually it was a northern shrike, which was a life bird for me. Nice. But um, yeah. That's kind of how it started. Cool, awesome. Well, thanks for being here. Um, and let's see, who else we got? Frank Fogarty, the newest newest member of, one of the newest members of the Humboldt birding community here. Yeah, I think I've certainly oh, got that. I've, uh, I've been birding <laughs> in Humboldt for, I guess coming up on two years now since I since I moved up here from, from Oakland. Uh, I guess I've been birding. I was trying to find my old field guide from when I was a kid with all of the had the little checklist in the back. And it's it's just comical to look through all the things that I had thought I'd seen in, in Central Florida, like tube noses and things that eight-year-old <laughs> me was was checking off in there. It's great. Um I think I really started seriously birding and actually knowing what I was doing um near the end of college from a um a June challenge rather than Christmas bird count. We used to do the the June county challenges and I just decided to to do it one year and uh, found some white rum sandpipers. I think that was kind of the uh, uh, the spark bird for me to get started there in the in the early two thousands. Nice. And then yeah, I've been birding mostly in California and a lot in Nevada where I've worked behind me here um, for the the last uh, decade or so. Cool. Well, we're glad you're here and glad you're at HSU. Uh, you're teaching wildlife, been teaching wildlife since you've been here. Uh, 
doing a lot of ornithology classes, correct? Yep. And what other classes are you doing? Almost all ornithology related stuff. Yeah. Okay. Right now. Cool. Yeah. And doing senior projects with the wildlife students. Nice. Nice. Well, welcome. Thanks for being here. And uh, I guess I guess I should say something since um, since I'm here too. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm Rob Fowler. If you haven't seen me before, I mean, you know that I'm hosting this, I guess. So, but anyways, uh, I got started birding, well, bird watching, I guess you could say, because I didn't really keep a list or anything. But um, when I was a kid, I was about ten or eleven. Bird feeder at Kmart. Asked my mom to buy it. We bought it. Came home, put it up. Sat by the feeder for weeks, just looking out my bedroom window, hoping something would show up. And finally, something did. And and there were my first house finches. And um, I had no idea there was any <laughs> birds in the neighborhood that were that had like red in their color. So that was pretty exciting. So I guess that was kind of my spark bird. And then I took my dad's little pair of Nikon Travelite binoculars that he had and beat the heck out of them running around the neighborhood just trying to find birds and stuff. And then we'd, we'd go on camping trips and I'd look for birds and stuff. But um, I didn't really, I can't say I really became a birder uh, until I moved to Monterey and in like, was it 1998 and then um, was birding around and I found a prothonotary warbler at Como River Mouth and that really just kind of kicked it off for me and then I started meeting people like um, Craig Holmberger who was one of my kind of big mentors in Monterey County when I lived down there and then um, so I lived down there for seven years or so and then I moved up to Humboldt County in, in 2003 to major in wildlife here. And, um, and I've been here ever since. So that's about it. That's kind of my story. So let's see here. Um, why don't we go back to Tom Leskew and we could do the Bird of the Year Award. Tom, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. And why don't, um, maybe since, Whoever's not going to be part of the Bird of the Year Award, why don't we just mute ourselves and mute our video, and we'll let Tom just take it from here for a bit. And then um, when we're done with the Bird of the Year Award, we could just all come back on the video and start having our, our little discussion here and stuff and, and have a good time. So take it away, Tom. OK, I'm here tonight to present the 8th Annual Humboldt County Bird of the Year Award. The award is intended to honor the rare species that seem to home in on Humboldt as a nice place to visit and the dedicated birders that pound the patches to dig them out for others to enjoy. The award is sponsored by Fowler Road Birding Tours and the website tomlescue.com. The top five contenders were selected based on their rarity in the county with a plus if their sighting was seen by many people or generated some visitor spending. The nominees for calendar year 2020 in alphabetical order by bird name are common grackle, eastern yellow wagtail, mass booby, northern weed ear, and roseate spoonbill. In fifth place is a bird Greg Gray spotted October 21 at the Moxon Dairy in the Arcata Bottoms. The common grackle was a third county record and had over 25 eBird checklists submitted between October 24 and November 5th. Interestingly, its time here overlapped with a great tailed grackle at the Arcata Safeway. In fourth place is Eastern Yellow Wagtail, found by Keith Slauson on September 24th on Cannibal Island Road near Lolita. It was the second confirmed Humboldt record, the first seen in over 10 years, and stayed for at least four days, allowing about 20 people to see it. Six days earlier, the third place bird, a northern weed ear, was discovered by Keith in the McKinleyville Bottoms near the Hammond Bridge. This was another second confirmed Humboldt record, 
the first being in Shelter Cove way back in 1977. Keith estimates about 100 people saw it between September 18th and 19th as the bird made its way onto nearly 40 eBird checklists. The runner-up award goes to a mass booby cited by Charlie Giannini on November 22nd, about a half mile from shore. His boat was near the Humboldt Bay entrance where he was helping his grandparents pick up crab pots. The, the bird circled their boat multiple times, allowing Charlie to take a video with his cell phone of this first Humboldt sighting of this species. So the Humboldt... Charlie, do you want to say something about your sighting? Oh, I, I mean, I didn't really have anything to say. I just was really excited to happen to be out there at the right time. And it was sitting just right, right by the crab pot. So it just kind of blew me away. It was, it was pretty cool. Nice, very nice. So the Humboldt County Bird of the Year for 2020 goes to Roseate Spoonbill. On Halloween morning, Alex Ben spotted a large bird wading in the Mad River Slough near the bridge on the way to Lanfear Dunes. Chasers were disappointed that they couldn't catch up with the bird. The last Northern California record was in 1978 in Monterey. Uh, Alex's bird was a first Humboldt record, and it was sighted again near Fernbridge on November 8th. Congratulations to Alex, who will receive custody of the plaque for the next year. Alex, are you, are you there and wish to say a few words? Yeah. Oh, that, I'm honored to have this. Can everybody see me, or do I need to share a screen? Yeah, I can see. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm I'm incredibly honored. Wow. Um, I I mean, I guess really all I have to say is right time, right place. I'm humbled to be on the, you know, uh, sharing the screen with some of these, you know, birders who've been doing this for so long. Um, I I'm a, I wouldn't say I'm a beginner birder. I wouldn't say I'm I'm an expert. Uh, I've been birding since about 2016, and um, I just noticed something kind of out of place with this bird. I thought, well, that's not a local species. I haven't seen that one before. So um, yeah, no, oh, wow. Um, I'm, I'm glad I was there to document it. <laughs> OK, thank you much. Just say we'll be in touch with you the plaque. We'll be in touch with you about getting the plaque to you. Okay. Watch for a feature article by Sue Leskew about these five species and their finders that will appear soon in the Mad River Union. Okay. I'm burning to everyone during Godwood days and throughout the year. Can you both smile for a screenshot picture? Yes, Here, hold up the plaque again. Don't put it in. Wonderful. All right, that's it for Bird of the Year. All right. Thanks, Tom, and congratulations, Alex. Uh, such a man, such a great bird. <laughs> and, and so funny that uh, that it was, you know, you guys, you saw it, and then another person saw it, but uh, you know, none of the none of us humble birders could catch up with it. But uh, <laughs> so kind of funny. But what a great bird, man! And just God, so glad that you got that video. And thanks for submitting it to the CBRC for review. You know, obviously, you know, be accepted pretty readily and easily. And um, and thanks, Charlie, too, for, you know, submitting those videos for the mass movie and stuff. That was, that's an amazing bird. Just so cool to be in the right place, the right thing for that also, and to uh, just get the video that you did. I don't know if you saw, but um, I took a screenshot of the video and clipped and cropped it and zoomed it in a little bit. And you could actually see in the photo that um, from the from the screenshot that it actually has you know pretty nice yellow bill so pretty obvious mass booby so pretty cool and uh, but maybe a bird that we'll all have the chance to see again and you know maybe the, a roseate spoonbill will show back up here again sometime in the future the world's getting warmer and uh, some of these <laughs> southern birds are kind of moving further north so like Nazca boobies becoming 
much more expected in California and off the California review list now and stuff. So we'll probably get some of those and we'll probably get some more mass movies in the future. So um, so hopefully some of us will be able to run into them too. So thanks guys, really appreciate it. And thanks Tom. Yeah, for hey, doing hey your Rob, part. Yeah. I would be remiss if I didn't also offer congratulations to Keith Slauson for his two amazing birds, which yeah. were nominated as well as Greg Gray. Yes. Yes, indeed. And the weed air, you know, was definitely the uh, chaseable bird of the year, you know, with, with how easy it was for everybody to see that bird and how fast Keith got the word out. I mean, he, he texted me and, and put it on the chats like immediately. And I'm sure that was probably hard to do with probably his handshaking from finding such a cool bird um i know i sure i sure would have been flipping out if i was him but um that was an amazing bird to catch up with for a lot of people and while it was here everybody got to see that bird uh pretty readily i don't think anybody missed it except the people that missed it after it, it had already left so it was pretty pretty outstanding bird so so thanks keith for for finding that bird too and I don't know if people know, but um, you know Keith has found quite a few good birds just right in the McKinleyville bottoms, and it's kind of you know it's kind of Slauson's patch, I would say, with uh, with you know the weed ear he found, and then the little bunting he found there, and then just recently the uh, I'll point to it, the lesser nighthawk, right there that was just at uh, the Hammond Bridge a couple of weeks ago. So anyways, thanks Lawson for, for doing your part as always, man. He's so good. Um, but yeah, is everybody back now? Back in queue here, feel free to turn back your video and sound on if you'd like. Oh, looks like, like Sean, Sean's here now. Hey, Sean. You hear Sean? I'm here, Rob. Hey, welcome. How you doing, man? Thank you. I'm doing great. I'm completely yeah. underslept. I'm in oh. Merlet, Merlet <laughs> mode. It's been a long week. Yeah. Yeah. Grizzly Adams guys... has appeared. <laughs> <laughs> What's that you say, Tony? If Grizzly Adams had appeared, he would have that one. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually pretty freaking envious, Sean. Oh, yeah. Nice beard you got there, man. Yeah. No, this That's is all trimmed good. up even. I trimmed it up for y'all. Is that like three or four days old or something? Or what? What's going on there? Uh, well, it's not as old as Gary Lester's beard. Oh, okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he wins the competition here. The beard of the year competition, I think, for sure. <laughs> um. So, Sean, we just uh, did introductions and stuff right before the Bird of the Year Award, uh, which we just finished up. So would you like to tell us a little bit about who you are and maybe how long you've been birding and maybe how you got into birding and stuff? I suppose I can do that briefly. Okay. Um, Sean McAllister. I got into birding um, in uh, 1992. And it all is tied to uh, marbled merlets for me. Um, and I, uh, well, yeah, I don't want to make a long story here, but um, I was I was going to school at College of the Redwoods, and um, I was in a class taught by Ben Hawkins. Some of you may know Ben, um, and it was a uh, I think it was called Birds of the North Coast, and I'd already done fish and trees and wildflowers and stuff, and birds were kind of the next thing to to learn and. Um, he was inspiring to me, and I um, I had to do a paper on on a bird, like pick a species and do a do a little write up. And um, I had heard about the marbled merlet. That was the year the marbled merlet got listed, and um, and there was a conference or some sort of workshop about it. And I decided to go get some information so I could write up this paper. And I ended up landing my um, my first uh, summer job doing during doing biology at that conference, <clears throat> CJ Ralph was there and um, telling us all about marble merlets and it was really about 
this protocol that had just come out. And uh, so that got me in touch with, um, I got a job working for NRM with, under Rob Hewitt. And uh, Rob was my uh, supervisor there. And most of you all know Rob Hewitt and you can just imagine how, you know, he, uh, he took me under his wing, so to speak, and, and taught me what birding is all about. Um, so I started palling around with him and David Fix and they introduced me to folks like Gary Lester and Doc Harris and Tom Lescu. And um, so I'd go birding with, with those guys. Um, and I was really green and I learned the ropes really from the, from them. And uh, <clears throat> I guess the rest is history, really. I, that's, that's my, my birding story in a nutshell. And I'm still doing marbled merlots and I'm still birding, although not as much as I'd like to. Um, and uh, yeah, and then, you know, th in those days, Stan Harris was uh, kind of uh, directing us, as, at least that was my impression. You know, he'd get on the, he'd call me up and he'd say, Sean, you'll, you know, you got to go find, you know, go chase this uh, reported red throated pippet or whatever it was. And I, and I started realizing, oh, I've got a, a job to do here. You know, so it was partly that, but mostly just, you know, Dave, Dave Fix, the Lesters, Lescu, Hewitt, and, um, you know, and there, I, I, I kind of came in behind them and uh, John Sterling and um, others. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Amazing. Cool. Thanks, Sean. Uh, so, so since you're just talking about merlets, I know you've been surveying for merlets many years. How many years have you been surveying for merlets? Because I think it might be close to a record almost, huh? For... Well, yeah, this is year 30. Wow. Yeah, I just started hmm. year, my 30th consecutive year doing marbled merlets. And you know what? Yeah. I just saw Jude, Jude's uh, face on the screen. I need to include her in this. Uh, Jude was a big part of that in those days as well <laughs> of my uh, my birding influences awesome man um, yeah so great since yeah, uh 30 years yeah wow congratulations man jeez i guess <laughs> <laughs> is there anybody else that has been surveying for merlets that long do you know of anybody or well you know i've been kind of asking around yeah um because it is a bit of a landmark heck it was a landmark at 10 years yeah and then 20 and then 25 and now here we are at 30 <laughs> there's people that are still involved with merlets that were actually doing it before i was 1991 um a number of people were doing it but as far as um doing it consistently every year i haven't met anyone that's that's quite made it there oh, um, Britt O'Brien you know Gretchen's uh, mm -hmm. husband and uh, he's he, I think he's only missed one year in the last 30 and then um, uh, Will Ritchie up in Washington he's right he's real close to that um, but yeah I don't know anyone else that's done it every year oh, yeah. that's, still doing it. that's amazing yeah so for uh, uh, yeah. participants that might be watching this and have not and aren't familiar with uh, merlet surveys uh, Sean do you want to describe what entails a merlet survey and how early you have to get up in the morning and and maybe yeah. how much hiking you might have to do in the dark and such because it's it's yeah. quite the feat the hiking part is pretty variable you know we it goes from anywhere from a, a, a drive up station to a station that you have to hike in the night before and camp, you know, camp, um, throw out a sleeping bag on a, some um, dusty slope somewhere. Um, yeah, they can be quite adventurous. Um, but the bottom, you know, what it really boils down to is a two hour survey that straddles sunrise, it starts 45 minutes before sunrise and goes 75 minutes after sunrise. And that's really what ultimately what made a birder out of me was being up with that dawn chorus every morning. And more often than not, we don't get marbled merlet detections, but there's always that dawn chorus. There's always other birds to work on. And that's how I learned most of my birds, that and stuff that, you know, the, the folks that I mentioned earlier taught me. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good job. If you want to be a, if you're a birder or an aspiring birder, you want to know, know more birds, 
Marble Merlet surveys are about as good as it gets because um, you're out there every morning for, for ear birding. It's good stuff. For sure. For sure. Cool, man. Well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, since uh, since we're kind of talking, we started talking about how you got into birding and kind of the past influences of yourself and such. Um, so why don't we maybe start talking about how what birding was like kind of back in you know the 80s and 90s and stuff compared to to like what it was today how we have you know ebird and we've got the whatsapp where everybody's talking on and sort of the <laughs> messenger and stuff you know like what were how was it back then compared to now and were some things better or or worse or or you know what do you guys think phone tree yeah I yeah. think the only thing is better if you like solitude. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, there's, there is something to be said for it. So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, the whole yeah. landscape has changed entirely. It's, you know, with all, like you said, Rob, the, the technologies that have come along. And uh, when I started birding, um, cell phones really weren't happening yet. And, um, and what we did have, well, we eventually we got the bird box. Otherwise it was just, you know, running out to the nearest cell phone. If you found something rare, run to find a ghost cell phone or go home and, and make some calls. And that was about it. And uh, nowadays it's completely changed. Everything is bam, right there. You know, um, all that information is instant. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was if it would ever happened up uh, here at Humboldt, but I remember you know down in Ventura County when I was starting birding, you know a place in Ventura County called McGrath State Beach. There used to be a a, a rock on a on a post by the by the road that you know right out right outside the park where birders would leave would leave sightings under on a piece of paper under the rock. <laughs> And that way, you know, it would actually be more accurate if you're out there to find up more up to date things and trying to find anything on a phone re recorded message. Wow, that's a new one. <laughs> I've <haven't> heard <laughs> that before. <laughs> Writing messages and putting it on a rock, man. Wow, that was back in the day. <laughs> yeah, the, yeah, that was the 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 lithic so age. The, the, you know, the ornolithic. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah, phone tree days um, were definitely different. In, uh, on June 12th, 1994, I found a singing bay-breasted warbler at Elkhead. There had only been one in the county since 1980, which I believe was in uh, the Lester's birch tree in West Haven. And being back in the phone tree era, I called a number of people that included Sean. And Sean was out, so I started to relay the details to his housemate. She said, let me grab a pencil. Okay. There's a bare breasted warbler <laughs> there. So uh, those 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 times were different. Yeah, I I also heard stories of amazing birds found at Elkhead where um pencilless and paperless birders were forced to write in the dust of the rear window of a minivan because they they knew the owner of the vehicle and and so they they were forced to write on the back of the window to say, hey, dude, when you get back to your car, there's a such and such, you know, at, at Elkhead, maybe you're already on it. I remember, um, I don't even remember what the bird is, maybe Gary does, but it was some rare bird that showed up and he and Dick Erickson were working in Hoopa or something. And I drove up to where there, that road comes into 101 and I put a big piece of butcher paper tied to a stump and I think they went by it I don't know Second one down below. oh I think I put two pieces up Gary might remember the story better and anyway um at some point I think Dick or, or Gary went wait 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 those those are our initials we need to go back and see what that says because they just had zoomed right by it but anyway I think they got the message and they got to the bird and they got to see it but that was that era and the phone tree, I remember spending an inordinate amount of time making many, many, many phone calls. That was like kind of how it happened. And then Gary, I'll pass it to him because 
I'm pretty sure it used to be that there was a list on Stan Harris's door. Yeah, we'd look forward to going up to Humboldt and Stan would have a list on his, on his office door. And that was the first thing you did when you, you, you wouldn't go to the co-op, you wouldn't, or you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't get gassed. You would, you would go to Stan's office and see what was on, on the list on, on, on his board. And then, you, then, then your, your, your trip to Arcata was planned and you would just follow up on those. And, and going back to Tom, I remember um, on the back of my camper shell in the dust, uh, Gary Strachan had written Dick Sissel in Trinidad at the horse pasture. So uh, that was our first first communication without cell phones. We had to do it by like smoke signals. <laughs> oh man. So when you when you guys had a phone tree, did you guys like have a list set up of people to call or did you just kind of think of people to call off the top of your head? I don't remember, Rob. Yeah. Ago. I just know I spent a lot of time on the phone. Yeah, <laughs> there was. Yeah, there wasn't really a list, but you, when you would get a call on the phone tree, you'd say, okay, who do I need to call? Who knows already and who needs to know? And then you'd say, okay, I'll call this person, this person, and this person. And you call this person. <laughs> so it was kind of informal that way. Um, yeah. And it was kind of a scramble. It's like, oh my God, I hope I'm not forgetting somebody really important. <laughs> Which sometimes right. happened. It did happen. Yeah, totally. <laughs> so, something would slip through the cracks. For sure. Well, somebody came up with, and I want to say it was Tom Leskew and or Gary Lester that came up with the wish to see list. Oh. I don't see either of you guys nodding. Cor correct. Okay. Correct. Um, and um, that was cool. And that was like right when I started. So they, I think they had started that bef before I got in involved. But um, when I got my hands on the wish to see list, there was two little booklets. We used the, um, the Western Field Ornithologist California checklist. And rather than doing like trips for each of those columns, it was uh, each person would have, you know, it, it, so it was, a, uh, it was their county list basically their Humboldt County list, and you could see, you know, who needed what, and then their phone numbers would be written on the inside, so we knew who to call, and I think each of us had a copy of that in our glove box in our vehicle, and so we could make the call. Nice. Correct. Nice. Yeah. Everybody got two copies, and one for your car, and one for your desk. <laughs> right. I just noticed Gail Kenny mentioned, um, she remembers the phone tree list and the list on Doc's door. Yeah, I remember it. that. That was where I got a lot of my information from. You know, things that just got written on on the list of uh, on Doc Harris's you know uh, office door. So cool. You know, I, I want to say that talking about that need to see list, Sean, you've actually created the equivalent of that now. Your Humboldt County list, mm -hmm. the the graph, and it's really easy as long as you have some sort of Wi-Fi connection or something. You can go on there really quickly and see who doesn't have this bird go to the species and read across yeah and so that's kind of the analog to that old system right. you know and it's still it's it's so efficient and so effective i want to thank you for yeah. that it really fills in a lot of gap yeah for or the sure, digital man. solution to the analog system yeah and that was <laughs> yes that yeah. was the uh okay, that wish yeah. to see list was what i based that on that was why i started that it's kind of turned into a little bit more or something other than that but um yeah that was the idea yeah you know and tom leskew is still looking out for all of us like last week tom <laughs> sent me a message speaking of sean's county list like jude you might want to put skylark and nighthawk on sean's list <laughs> it's like oh thank you tom <laughs> i'll do that right away <laughs> so th that feeling of looking out for each other you know, that happens among the old guard, what I call us, the old guard. I mean, right. that's the feel of how it used to be. It, and Humboldt was kind of known, I think, for being non-competitive. And I mean, of course, there are always egos. We all have egos, right? But um, it was a very non-competitive, supportive environment. And when David and I did big years, I remember people calling us 
people who had their own big years that we were trying to break, you know, and say, hey, I, I saw this bird, you guys need to get on it. I mean, that's how not competitive it was. Like everybody wanted everyone else to do well and get what they wanted. And it, that was a wonderful thing. And I don't see that so much anymore. I yeah. see that among us, but um, not well, in the zeitgeist. Yeah. Well, on the, other, on the other hand, I think even across birding in general, there are very few things that can be even remotely called competitive where there's a lot of active help going on, you know, such as through eBird. And I still really appreciate the extra phone call when something comes in. Mm -hmm. So then technology marched on. And I was the voice of the rare bird alert for about a year and a half around 95. And I would, once a week, I believe on Friday afternoon, I would go into the NEC and they had a cassette uh, phone, uh, you know, message thing. And I would, I would collate the sightings of the last week and put it on the cassette and then sort of pray that something wasn't found in the next 24 hours because <laughs> I didn't really want to have to return to the NEC and give the whole spiel all over again. But it was, it was interesting times because especially during spring and fall migration, which as we all know, moves very quickly, I would kind of say to myself, well, this is really more of a eulogy for <laughs> birds that have passed on. Yeah. Not, not quite Especially in the springtime. It's not a week long thing. Yeah, yeah. I would I would call it, you know, religi religiously, you know, knowing when the update would happen. And, you know, more often than not, you're right. It was just like, oh, darn, it's not likely to be able to find that one. But I'd try anyway. But, you know. <laughs> So when yeah. did the when did the bird box kind of start then? Um, yeah, that revolutionized things really. Yeah. What year um, was that? Does anybody remember? Hmm. Elias was, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, no, it was in the nineties. It was okay. ninety five. It was the year I remember um, because I I actually called in the uh, I found a Cassin's kingbird up on Bear River Ridge. Some of you will remember. Oh. That. Wow, yeah. And they called. Yeah. I knew that Ron LaValley was down at the city of Arcata um, working on that, setting that up. And I called in and I officially, technically, got the first, laid the first uh, report on the bird box, although I don't think it actually went out. Uh, I ended up actually talking to Ron and telling him about it. Um, <laughs> but I think that was 95. It's yeah, that'd be correct because yeah, sounds... my tenure was 94, 90, you know, into 95 sometime. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when it was the bird box then, it was, uh, was it just like a, like an answering machine that people would call and check and then people would be able to call and check messages and stuff? And leave them too. And leave yeah. them, yeah. Yeah, okay. so it, re it really revolutionized things because you'd at least have the possibility of being able to, I mean, you know, you still had to call and check to see if there was anything and, and you know, and then, you know, sometimes it would be busy, <laughs> right? but, <laughs> but, yeah. but it was, it still made it a lot easier to get onto things quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I just looked at my notes that Sue provided us for this morning and it was 96 that the bird box started. Mm. Okay. Oh, okay. Thanks, Alex. All right. Thank you. It was Loon was the end. L -O -O. Right. Yep. E -two -two loon. E -two -two yeah. Loon. E -two -two loon. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so burned into. <laughs> Anybody try and call that lately just to check and make sure there's nothing? <laughs> um, maybe in my sleep, but I don't know. <laughs> it was my favorite era because I feel like it was really accessible to everybody. People yeah. from that area mm -hmm. could know it. You didn't have to have a special invite. I'm sorry to get on WhatsApp. It, yep. it was just available to everybody. And and it, it relieved the phone tree thing. I don't know. It was my favorite. I'm sorry. Yeah. John. Very democratic, you know? And yeah. Like, I, 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 I completely miss hearing the bird box too, you know? Cause like, 
it was it was really kind of a, a a real human kind of connection you get to even though you're listening to you know somebody else's message and stuff like you know say if somebody like you know found a really rare bird like a first county record or something like that and they called it in the bird box you could just hear the excitement in their voice mm -hmm. and you could really like get a sense of like you know how how excited and how emotional they might have been whereas like today you know whatsapp and messenger i mean it's cool because you get the messages out quick and stuff but i kind of feel like that that human element has been lost a little bit with just yeah it was neat you know yeah on like the I other remember, hand i remember um when i was down a big oh, go ahead there <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Well, anyhow, I was thinking as far as the human element, I think one of the one of the things that maybe has replaced that is is the sort of like flash mob social gathering aspect of finding of, of rarities now, That's a where good the word point. gets out so fast that it becomes a social event. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Like all the like all these recent, you know, like the, take the weeder for instance, you know. Um, well, they always were social events, but just not quite the flash mob. Aspect. Not quite the flash mob. A little bit thing, slower yeah. evolving. Yeah, yeah. But, and but more of more remember, of an invitation only kind of thing. I just called the bird box. It's busy. <laughs> it's busy. <laughs> that means someone's <laughs> leaving a report of a really rare bird. Oh it, man, I'm gonna sit by my phone. Sorry, guys, I gotta go. I gotta wait for the call. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well the bird one thing box... that, about the bird box that was really fun was you could also leave messages that were not about reporting a rare bird. Like, right, right. I remember early on, I left this message like, I saw it. I saw the Western gull swallow the starfish. <laughs> right. I think I remember that. Just for fun. And those were really great messages, too. It was so much more personal. Yeah. Yeah, they got creative in like February and March when there's nothing else going on. We got yeah. all kinds of interesting stuff. So um, what were, I could think of some of my favorite bird box messages up here since I've been here when it was still in order. Does anybody else have any like <laughs> fun bird box messages they remember? I, I, I actually used to do a few cartoons for the Eco News based on the bird box, you know, or put them, you know, mm. based, you know, when someone would say, you know, you know, I, I saw the, I saw the Kara Kara driving while driving by on 101. <laughs> so it, it makes makes for an obvious cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else want to say any of their? remembering I've, box. I've got an unforgettable one. Uh, Brad Elbert and I were out on the North Spit birding and that previous spring I've been back east so I got kind of dialed in on the calls of um, Great Crested Flycatcher. So we had a herd only bird that was going weep weep and so I, you try to juggle the situation of, well, a first or second county record versus we have yet to get a visual on the bird. If we, if we spend another 10 minutes getting a, trying to get a visual and we finally do, but then the bird leaves, I'm going to be in deep doo-doo with a bunch of people for not calling it in sooner. So Brad said, no, we don't have a visual on it. Don't call it in yet. And I said, sorry, I'm overriding you. I'm calling it in. So, and of course, this is one of the aspects to, a, to going live. So I'm leaving the message and you can hear the bird still calling on the phone as, as I'm leaving the message. And then suddenly Brad goes, oh, wait, I got a visual. It's, it's, it's. Oh, it's a cockatoo. <laughs> oh! Yeah, I remember that. So there, there I was in all my glory, you know, with this phoning in this this cockatoo. Oh, man. It, it was a, like a problem with a herd only bird that I'd never really considered before. But they do a they do a pretty credible uh, simulation. <laughs> oh man. Uh, yeah, that's a bird that really needs to show up again sometimes that that bird's overdue but a cockatiel 
Yeah, the, the yeah, well, of course, man. Cockatoo. <laughs> yeah, I want to see one of those. Take it off on my cockatoo. Introduce. Oh, it was oh, a cockatoo? cockatoo. Yeah, it was a cockatoo. I, I oh, wouldn't okay. mistake in a cockatoo. Ooh. Oh, man, I remember uh, when Ken Irwin found the Cassin Sparrow. I think it was. Oh, somebody just let Katniss out. She's chasing birds out in the backyard. Darn it. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, and I remember him saying, yeah, I just found a cash and sparrow at, at uh, the Oric Levy. Uh, just take your Chevy to the levee and park and then, <laughs> and then walk up to whatever distance he said. That was pretty memorable. Yep, I remember that one too. Yeah. <laughs> that <was classic. laughs> so take your Chevy to the levee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then another one I remember, excuse my, my curse in it, but... Uh, I remember when Lucas Brew called in a Glockus goal from Del Norte County. <laughs> and he was like, y'all, there's a set third, I can't remember what cycle it was. We'll just say third cycle or something. He's like, y'all, there's like a third cycle Glockus goal in the spray lines and it's just completely covered in shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's <was> legendary. <laughs> it's so legendary. It just doesn't translate as well, just typing it out, you know? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, Ken uh, Irwin had some good ones. Um, he was oh, right. he could be so dry and brief. He'd say things like, uh, "There's a red eye at Elkhead." Quick. Yep. <laughs> Quick. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh man, has anybody seen Ken lately at all? No. No, I talked to him about two months ago. Okay. Yeah. He's so, yeah. doing all right. Yeah, that's good. I know yeah. he kind of got into he kind of got into insects a lot. Hmm. The last couple of times I've seen him, he's been way into bugs and stuff. More than kind of more than birds. Um Yeah, he's yeah, he was one of the first people though to to really start working the crossbill calls out. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if people aren't familiar with Ken Irwin, um, he was, he's one of the legendary birders of Humboldt County and kind of like an enigma, you know, like he would always, he always birds by himself and he's found so many, so many amazing birds over the years that have been confirmed like you know, the green shank, common green shank, uh, let the white eyed vireo out of Trinidad, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'll kill. Yeah. What other ones? That he, found. I got he a, found that scissor tailed flycatcher, the last adult scissor tailed flycatcher that was out at uh, Mad River Slough. I think it was right after the wood thrush. Oh, yeah, B Street, uh, B Street Loop. It was there with two tropical kingbirds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ken Irwin, um, when he was into the crossbills and recorded them, there was a summer that. He spent more time in my yard than I did. <laughs> and I was getting calls from the neighbors and saying, you know, there's a, there's a strange character that's walking around your property and on outside your yard. Are you concerned about that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I, I was working and you know, Lauren and the kids were out doing their things, but you come home and there's Ken in the yard, hurting. <laughs> <laughs> Was he abandoning them too in your yard, Gary? Yeah, you, you put this net up and ban them here. Yeah. Wow. Ooh. Do you know how many birds he banded in your backyard? In your no, guys' backyard? No idea. Yeah. No. yeah. We, just, wow. we just cut him loose to do his thing. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. My yeah. uh, my first uh, experience with Ken. Um, so because of the bird box, there were several people that I only heard before I actually met them. And Ken Irwin was one of those people I'd call the bird box. And just like Sean was saying, very brief message. I'm just like, Jesus, this is such a good bird. You know, like, who is this guy? So I was out at the airport patch. And I think this was probably in the fall. And um, here comes this guy that pops out of the patch and he just like 
Ken always had this like walk that he'd do where he'd kind of hold his head down and put his hands behind his back. And he just came walking up to me and he was like, I had a black throated blue warbler in the horse pasture patch. And I was like, Oh my gosh. You know, like I think Dave Spangenberg was with me. I'm like, who is this guy? So we talked to him and that was the first time I met Ken. And because he came out of the airport patch for, I think for the first year, I thought the airport patch was the horse pasture patch. So I went immediately into it looking for this black throat blue and I wasn't even in the right patch. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. I remember hearing stories of like, you know, hanging out, people would go to Patrick's point and stuff and go bird Patrick's point. And then Ken just like walks out of the bushes somewhere and he starts drawing crossbill calls on his hands and stuff and describing <laughs> them to you and stuff. You know? <laughs> so amazing. So, but if, pe if people aren't familiar, like um, participants, Ken Irwin, he, he actually described a uh, crossbill type up here in Humboldt County, which is the type 10 Sitka spruce crossbill. And he actually uh, published a paper in Western Birds. Um, can't remember how many years ago it was, but that was the latest type of crossbill described. Um, and there's 10 types. And, uh, and then recently the um, Cassia crossbill was split out as its own species in Idaho. But um, so Ken Irwin is completely responsible for, for uh, describing the type 10 crossbill, which um, if you're not familiar with crossbill calls, just technical and stuff, but you can identify types one to 10 by their flight calls. So if you wanna learn more about it, you can uh, read about it on eBird. There's a couple of articles on eBird where it has like call type demonstrations and recordings you can listen to. But anyways, hey, so can I? Thing. So where is the um, airport patch, Tony? Did you ever find it? I'm just by kidding. the airport. By the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Hey, yeah, it's the it's the um, it's the the willow patch on the other side of the airport on you know the the the, the Malka side. <laughs> the what side? <laughs> it's oh. a Hawaiian Hawaiian term for you know inland versus Makai, which is towards the ocean. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, it's actually pretty useful in Humboldt. I used to park <laughs> right at the big patch of eucalyptus trees where it comes right into <clears throat> the the road there. And then there was a, a trail that kind of went in. And yeah, you were, I guess, in the airport property at the time when you were in the patch, which I guess is how it got its name. Mm. Mm, thank you. Yeah. It, That's does, Oyster Bay, I believe now, the kind of little resort. And oh, you're, you're out there. Oh, out I Out by know. Oyster Bay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Humboldt Social yeah. Club. Yeah, the Humboldt Social Club, yeah. I thought you were by the- Yeah, um, it's a little north of it. Of that. National Airport, you know. Yeah, these are oh. these are all locations out on the North Spit, Alex. Um, okay. Driving out Old Navy Base Road, and yeah, from yeah. from uh, um, Fairhaven mm -hmm. all the way to out to the kind of big cypress patch and stuff at the south end of the Spit. Yeah. Well, I remember I going birding with I don't know who out of this group. And they said, you know, this is okay to come with us, but you should never go into this area by yourself. And we were wandering through thickets and so forth. And it was out by, it was out there by the social club somewhere. Mm -hmm. All these sort of little haunts that they had. I, I don't know if that's the right term for you birders to call them haunts. Yeah. Right. Dune Hollow, I think, well, I think they're kind of termed, well, I know Doc termed them, termed them Dune Hollow Willows, Patrick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because right. in the winter time they get rain, and then flood, and then you know you don't want to go birding out there in the spring and summertime because it's just like you get carried well, off by mosquitoes, or... <laughs> you know, because it's so so wet still. But the fall is when um, kind of those patches really became alive and people put in trails and stuff. Yeah. 
Does yeah, anybody the, want to talk about that, like uh, in terms of the old North Spit patches and um, like maybe how they've changed? Well, the names became years. formalized. I think the names were f sort of formalized with the uh, birding in and around Arcata, you know, book that came that was published. They're, they don't get birded as much as they used to. Oh, we got a screen share coming on here. Nice. Yeah. From well, Bob. Airport and entrance patch, you used to be able to walk all the way through, and now you can't. <clears throat> since, yeah, we're, no. since we're talking about the patches, I just thought of a um, uh, just one brief bird that really just kind of stands out to my mind. Um, the horse pasture patch, just an incredible patch and just a lot of amazing birds over the years. But um, I decided to go in there in the winter. You know, I feel like we hit it pretty hard in the fall. but And then, of course, the spring is pretty slow because of the mosquitoes and all that. But I remember going in in the winter and, you know, for the most part is what I, I what I expected, pretty dead. But uh, I was pretty amazed to find a gray jay uh, in the horse pasture patch. Oh. Um, I've never had one on the North Spit before. Um okay. It was kind yeah. of strange, you know, in those oh, willows. Awesome. Yeah, I think wow. I've seen one there. I can't remember. I know, you know, rough grouse and I think rough grouse and sooty grouse were both found at the horse pasture patch once. Really? Yeah. Weird. Yeah. I can't remember who found them. Does anybody remember that? I don't remember the grouse story yeah. and of Ken Irwin comes to mind. <laughs> Most yeah, likely Ken Irwin. Yeah. Yeah. My, so can so I the, year that, the year that the uh, year that Daryl Coldren was doing his big year, we were out in horse pasture and with Ken Irwin, and Ken Irwin asked me about. Um, I, I asked him where exactly had the golden wing warbler been found in the horse pasture. So as many times as I've been to the horse pasture, he takes me to the extreme northwest corner which I was unfamiliar with. And of course the trails hadn't been maintained in there and we had to bash our way in. And then lo and behold, there's like a year round spring there, which obviously is very enticing for migrant birds. So we, we one day we dug it out and then people were bringing in gallon jugs of water and punching a small hole in them to do a drip. <laughs> and, you know, quite a cadre of, of empty and filled gallon milk cartons built up in there for a while. <laughs> I, turned to, I turned to Ken and said, well, you know, these places all need names. And so we're going to wait until, you know, the next quality vagrant shows at this pond and then name it. And he kind of turns to me with like, equal measure of professorial as well as offended and said, well, Tom, I said, this is where the golden wing warbler was found. This is known as golden pond. <laughs> so I said, okay, okay. I stand, I stand corrected. So speaking of golden wing warbler out at Fairhaven, um, my first my first experience with the airport patch was I was it, it was mid 70s getting out of class and here comes um, is either Gary Friedrichsen or Steve Summers coming up to toward they're going to go up and leave a note at Stan's office you're coming up by the um, biology building at Humboldt and they're just like out of their minds and he, he I think he's like sees he sees Strachan or Summer sees Strachan and just says Brewster's fucking warbler at the airport patch <laughs> and then everyone dropped what they were doing and uh I just sort of tagged along and one of the best birds ever found in, in Humboldt County uh, that uh, was a Schulenberg Summers Erickson bird uh, at, at the airport patch. Best, um, 
best horse pasture bird. <laughs> yeah. That we can't Black count. <laughs> Black Bill Cuckoo for me. Black Bill anyway. Cuckoo, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> gonna oh, say that. Man. That's a dream bird. Yeah, Sean, I love your story about the black billed cuckoo. <laughs> Just like being dialed in to all the little move, the little tiny things that move, the frog. I, I love the way you always told that. Oh, yeah, right. Well, I didn't find the bird. Uh, Brian Karras found that in uh, 1996. And um, a number of people had already seen it, but it was a really difficult bird. Um, that was the, the story. And I, I had just scoured that patch and didn't find it. I finally went back in one more time and I was just hell bent on, on finding it. Um, and I just stayed in there for a couple of hours and decided to just wait for the bird to find me. And I was so cued in, like you said, Tony, I, I was seeing things like a, a, a chorus frog or tree frog, just do this. You know, <laughs> those kinds of movements were catching my eye. And finally, finally, I see a movement from, uh, you know, up in the canopy and it's the cuckoo just does this. It just turned its head and that was it. And there it was, it was there the whole time. So yeah, it was a, it was, it was a tough bird, but uh, what a, what a doozy that was. Yeah. That's incredible. So uh, just so people can know, that haven't been there before for maybe out of town that are watching this this is the horse pasture here it's and uh big yeah it's big yeah and, and this is uh what the satellite patch people call this the satellite patch i think right across no, the street I think the satellite patches in oh satellite patches over the here airport. right it's the satellite yeah. to the yeah. airport patch to the airport right here yeah so yeah. here's the airport right. patch uh, here's the airfield. See the Samoa field. Um, and then is this the wormhole patch? I think yes. that's the wormhole patch where there was a worm eating warbler one year. Okay. Yeah. And then boat ramp patch right here. And then if you go down further, 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 here's the cypress patch where there's been all kinds of great birds there. Um, and then the newest one that people have checked in local recent years is the uh the waterhole patch i can't remember who started checking that keith was it maybe you that found i think it was like you found the black Burnian warblers or something that were here maybe over here i can't remember i don't think i was the first i just saw that bird go over there oh okay uh, other, other folks had found things prior like a prairie warbler and i thought yeah. tom lesky found something in there or at least put a name on the place yeah, I have found something in there. Um, trying to I think they were lower lower grade, but it's it was just so astonishing to find year round water out there in the middle of the dunes. Right. Yeah, there's like a little pond there and stuff. It's cool. Um, so I guess the horse pasture actually is it. I guess there used to actually be horses in there. Is that the case? Is that why it's over called here? That? I mean, just to the the east east of the willows. Their horses. Oh, over here or so? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right in Fairhaven, ran them. Okay. Okay. And it was, did it used to be a lot more open in the understory? Mm. Or was it always pretty, um, you know, shrubby, needing trails to be put in all the time? I think Ken Irwin claimed back in the day when the horse was there, you could see from the south end to the north end. It was pretty sparse with willows. Yeah. So, yeah. so can I ask about Alder Grove, uh, at the Alder Grove Walk in and Pond? Is that one of the worst places to bird? You mean in Arcata, Alex? Oh, yes, it's in Arcata. It's up by Alder Grove Industrial Park. No, that's a great spot. Yeah, there's it's nothing wrong with that. No, it's a great spot. Just not a lot of people go there. Here, I'll take you to it. If I could I just find said, my way. Birds it, and if they're what's there? Yeah, just what's not a lot of people go there. Worst? <laughs> well, maybe I'm just asking what are the worst birding spots that you've been to, and that, and so I was wondering because I never hear anyone talk about it. So, 
Yeah, it's like right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's just because it's so small and um, there's only like this one trail that goes through. And then you could walk this strip here. Some which, of us walked out water lines south. Yeah, this one right line, here, Tom. Which is pretty productive. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah that's a great spot. It is. Um, well, Cabot days, we've never gone out there that I'm aware of. Yeah. No, yeah. it's pretty limited access. It is. We go to the Willows all the time in Blue Lake. I'm just looking for some new places, I guess. I'm just asking. So, um, so does anybody have any like uh, real fun past days of birding or birding stories or something that maybe some people here haven't heard before that they want to just mention some some historical Humboldt County days uh, discoveries or maybe new site discovery or something like that. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, the Breeding Bird Atlas project, which mm -hmm. the field work was 1995 through 1999, that was certainly a highlight for me as well as some others. And one by one, the grail birds fell, and many of them were confirmed as breeders white throated swift, Lawrence's goldfinch, Rufus mm. crowned sparrow. And um, the, the extensive and intensive countywide coverage will probably likely never happen again. And so that was really a highlight for a bunch of us. And everybody, including Palco, was on board. We would, we would head out on blockbusters on weekends, um, accompanied mm -hmm. by Palco biologists, and hit, hit some blocks where people had not really gone before. And, um, you know, when Paul Springer turned up what turned out to be breeding Lawrence's goldfinch by uh, Showers Pass, that was, that was a huge thrill, catching up with those birds. And uh, Jude's got a pretty cool story about how the uh, uh, white-throated swifts were found at the Wagner Bridge, which um, I think she should tell instead of myself. Uh, <laughs> it was just one of those birding stories. Um, David and I were down there. We had, as the Atlas project progressed, access to parcels to the little squares became more and more and more problematic and more time consuming. And we had gotten access to a place on a hill down uh, south of Benbow and on the east side of 101. And um, so it was great. If you got access to a place in the center of something or out a road, you could bird your way there. You could bird all along the road, the access roads to get there. So we were headed up there behind multiple locked gates as it was down there, maybe still is. And um, we got off 101, we went underneath 101 and we're coming back up on the east side of it, heading to the mountain. And Fix had been drinking coffee as usual and had a full bladder. So we pulled off underneath the bridge so he could get out <laughs> and relieve himself. So, you know, in fix like manner, he gets out of the car, opens the door, starts to unzip his pants and just starts screaming, you know, <laughs> why is that a swap? Why is that a swap? <laughs> it's exciting. And so I bail out of the car and there they were just all over going into openings underneath the overpass that we had <laughs> gone underneath. <laughs> it was like the rustic bunting all over again. <laughs> so had he not been drinking coffee and held himself until we got to that point, <laughs> we would not have known about nesting white throat swift during the Atlas, possibly. So there were so many stories like that. But um, the Atlas, I agree with Tom. I mean, I was thinking maybe the big day with Sean McAllister and David and Elias was one of my favorite all-time birding days. 
but the whole Atlas period, I'm still nostalgic for. This was in the 90s and I miss it every single summer because it was so intense. It was like Sean talking about the marbled murlet surveys. If you wanna get good at birds and bird calls, you know, survey for marbled murlets at dawn. But the Atlas was like that um, every day, all day, looking and listening, looking and listening. And especially for the core group of us that were doing the bulk of the blocks in the county. Um, and also the aspect of it that was really unique was the access that we got. We, we got access to every single Atlas block and there were like 400 or something of them in the county, I forget the number, except one. <laughs> so we were really proud of that. And we got into some of the most indescribably beautiful landscapes in the county that we will never ever see again typically on ranches, um, some of them in timber area, but mostly big ranches. And so it was a really special time. And you're right, it'll probably never happen again. I mean, who's gonna coordinate that and organize that? And uh, it was a huge effort, but really special, yeah. <laughs> My favorite bird stories, I actually thought about this, Rob, after you sent out the initial email. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each one because I have like four or five here, but 1986, Kelsey was born, our first child. And three weeks before she was born, Gary and I spent the night at the base of Whitey's Peak and climbed Whitey's Peak. And that was my 300th county bird, common poor will. So that's got to be a highlight. Um, fall 2003, long billed Merlette was seen off of Trinidad. <clears throat> and number of bird watchers, I remember Jude, other people too were on shore and I said, I'm taking our inflatable kayak out there. And Michael Morris went, you're what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going with you. <laughs> so he got in his official boat and escorted. We had amazing looks at long billed yeah. Merlette very close and it was super special. Um, Long-eared owl on Horse Mountain. I think it was August 91. When we had flying squirrels and I think we spent oh, wow. back to back multiple nights up there we would pack it was we only had Kelsey then and we would take Kelsey and sometimes her friends and sometimes sometimes her friends parents and we would go up there and roast marshmallows and then the long-eared owl would show up or not show up and then we'd go home and Gary would go to work and we'd do swimming lessons and then we'd pack it back up and go back up again and we just did that multiple nights. It was very, very fun. And then I have to reminisce about Rock Wren with Gary and Del Norte County. We were working together and it was my first exposure to finding a rare bird, even though it wasn't that big of a deal of a rare bird, but to me it was a rare bird. And, um, you know, my, my getting an inside scoop into Gary and his passion for birds and you know, me, I like looking at them, but I, I didn't quite get the, the listing aspect of it. And then when Gary and I were talking about this bird stuff, um, I had to, had to bring up an all time favorite story of when we went to Alder Point, the center of the Emerald Triangle for what was probably a bogus report of a black chinned hummingbird. We spent hours but we were rescued out of the very warm sun by an original Alder Point family who invited us to the shade of their porch and fell this, fed us watermelon and way too sweet tea. And then ultimately a deer, deer meal and dessert. And, and anyway, it was just, it was an amazing experience to get into the middle of Alder Point and feel, you know, completely safe and, entertained by lots of stories and never see the bird but I think you kind of get the the common thread for me it isn't really the bird it isn't really the list it's the stories that go with all the experiences for me that yeah. just just yeah. keep me going and I know Gary has stories I gotta get him to talk <laughs> he says no he said enough he said no okay there we go <laughs> well talking about wrens it reminded me of when I've done you know, some canoe trips along the middle fork of the eel and for, you know, both times uh, went 
you know, down from the, the route from Alder Point to uh, uh, Fort uh, Seaward. Um, um, there was this one one spot where we'd camp, and there were canyon wrens that would sing there in the morning. And I'm I'm convinced that they they must breed there. And then, but yeah, because yeah. I mean, both both times we, we that we camped there in different years, they were singing there in the morning, and I'd see them. And, there was a question in the chat: When did Gretchen start birding? I yeah, assume. Gretchen. Yeah, Gretchen. When did you start birding? Well, I guess I'm the only one that can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I just got back here after putting a pizza in the oven, so good time. Um, I, I guess it would be when I moved here, really, from Oregon. I mean, I've been an animal lover and technically watching animals my entire life, but um, starting the wildlife program at HSU, um, that's when I started birding, really, with um, Mark Col Colwell and... Um, Stan Harris had already retired at that point, but he was sort of the uh, the godfather, I think, at that time. He was, uh, I remember him being on a field trip that we took to the marsh, and he was sitting up on a rock, and we were all sitting on the ground, you know, like, it was like a kindergarten class almost, you know, just, we were all in college, obviously, but we were just listening to Stan Harris like he was, you know, the master, which he was, and um and then I got my first job with Rob Hewitt with LBJ Enterprises, um, 1998, I think it was. And uh, yeah, he taught me a lot. So I thought that was probably kicked off my, my birding, really. It was 1998 and working for Rob and probably that's where I met all you guys, um, you know, not at work, but in that, in that time frame and realm, so. Um, yeah, and that's when I started working with God of Days too. Started uh, mm -hmm. helping coordinate God of Days in 1998. And it all just kind of snowballed from there <laughs> into lots of other different things. All right. Cool. I got a funny. Uh, and now you, you're working with Bob now, right, Gretchen? And yeah, so now I'm a biologist with SHN and uh, working under Bob. And um, yeah, that's been great. That's been a, a lot of different, more different things happening. So that's fun. I don't actually get out birding for fun as much as I used to, I think. It's just a combination of life. But, um, you know, sometimes it's just, that's what it is. But I'm always looking for birds no matter where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Safeway parking lot, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Bloomfield's story on on Canyon Run reminds me of of one um, when I worked in Willow Creek all those years in fisheries. We had a blasting project trying to improve access for steelhead up the creek of Willow Creek. And um, so when we were doing recon work there, I found a canyon wren at the base of what we called Redbud Slide, which you could sort of reach from the trail that goes down at Boise Creek Campground there, but then you'd have to ford Willow Creek. So we generally, we had permission from a private landowner to come in from the north side. And I've been around blasting quite a bit from like old growth stumps on road construction projects and rock pit um, development and so forth. So I take working around explosives very, very seriously. But some of my fisheries colleagues um, didn't take it quite as seriously. Um, so after I found that canyon wren there, I did phone it into the bird box, but I kept the I kept the directions intentionally very vague, just said it was like near the bottom of the trail that came out of Boise Creek Campground, not dreaming that anybody would chase it. So <laughs> unfortunately, on the day that, that we blasted down there, I got sick and I had I had arranged with my boss and colleagues that you guys got to take this blasting thing serious. You got to post somebody at the top of the trail, put soft horses 
at the at the entrance to the trail and just boom nobody can go down the trail so they kind of took the path of least resistance and there was a camp host there at the time that had a travel trailer so they um they they told the camp host that you need to look out for people uh, walking this trail. Well, if you're hunkered down in a travel trailer, that, that doesn't really work out very well. So Ron LaValle chases the canyon wren and gets to the bottom of the trail and sees my coworkers. And they don't exactly look like birders because they don't have binoculars. So he's a little bit taken aback. And then he goes, uh, do you guys know where the canyon run is? And they go, no, but you, you better get your tushy out of here pretty quick because we're about ready to blow this mountain. <laughs> so um, that was that was uh, very much of a um, cautionary note about you know sending sending people down the primrose path that isn't really that primrosey. <laughs> Uh-oh. Another, um, another era that is memorable for me were the uh, marbled murlet contracts awarded by Six Rivers National Forest from around 1997 through 99. It seemed like uh, Elias Elias was turning up noteworthy birds from Southern Trinity every other day. Um, John Hunter, who was administering the contract, somehow talked the uh, contract administrators into the idea of, well, we're doing these, we're doing these uh, veg plots and trying to link habitat types with marbled merlet. So we need somebody who isn't really doing the, the MAMU surveys to just sort of be like a hired gun and see what's out there in all these different habitats. And so that was sort of um, his rationale for getting Elias on board, just, you know, to be like a Keith, you know, just, <laughs> just go places and look for birds. And um, during, the, during the 1999 season, I served as inspector. I took over for John Hazard. And um, we did a follow-up on a possible Mamu sighting in the Marble Mountains of all places that turned out to be Black Swifts. And so um, Sean and myself and G. John and Kerry Ross, we had a nice little um, cross-country backpack into the marbles um, following up on this, this you know, nanosecond look at 5 10 a.m which possibly could have been a mamu that turned out to be black swifts and given the given the fact that all three sightings were at about 5 10 in the morning we probably weren't at all that far from their nest site but we kind of left it to uh you know younger younger fresher legs and preferably with some technical rock climbing experience <laughs> to uh, try to pin down the nest site in Siskiyou. Yeah, Tom, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. We Carrie is in town, as you've heard, I'm sure he found the black vulture up in Del Norte. Um, he and I told that story this morning to a group of about 10 people standing up in Prairie <laughs> Creek. Same story. And there's a lot more to the story than Tom just told you. There's a lot more deep, interesting details, but uh, yeah, that was, that was a good one. Yeah, it's fun. I'll, um, well, we're, oh, go ahead, Gary. Had, um, without Lauren, because um, she stood me up. It was, um, Maybe my my first date with Lauren to um, meet out at Elk Head and go bird watching, eighty three or something, and um, she didn't show up. But Gary Strachan and I met there and uh, decided to go bird watch the trail, and um, we found a yellow throated vireo, and um, it took it took Lauren, I think. Um, seven or eight more years before um, she got to um, see her own yellow-throated vireo in Humboldt. That 
that video was awkward because um, Gary Strack and I argued over the identification at Elkhead and then proceeded to argue all the way to Humboldt and go into the museum with Stan to look at skins. And Stan said, this is ridiculous. It doesn't matter. It, it's either a pine warbler that Gary thought it was, or it's a yellow-throated vireo. We got to go see this bird. Mm. So uh, <laughs> I, I was pleased that I was right. And uh, and uh, I, I'm pleased also that um, I'm with Lauren now. and. Um, she got to see y'all throw it very eventually herself. Nice. He gave me another chance to go out with him. <laughs> and here we are today. <laughs> was that the first, that was the first county record, wasn't it? It was, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Man. Um, let's see here. So we're at 633 right now on my computer, at least. Um, Maybe we should ask and see if there's anybody in the audience that has any questions or comments or wants to raise their hand and maybe, I don't know, if you want to share a story too of some birding in the past or even, heck, you can share a story of birding uh, today if you want, whatever. That's fine. Oh, I just kind of Hell out of the meeting here. Okay, I can see myself. Um, Peter Carlson. So is there, in the is there any... Carlson. Excuse me, sorry. We have Peter Carlson here raising a hand in the attendees. May we unmute him? Oh, yeah, Peter Carlson. Where, let's see. Did you want to do that, Trishana, or... Um... Go ahead, go ahead, okay. Peter. Pete. I think I'm unmuted. Yeah, you are. You yep. got a video too you want to hey, show Rob. you want to show your face? We hear you, Pete. I don't see any video. Options. We don't have that option unless we bring him up to a panel. But, uh, oh, okay. Okay. First, go first ahead, I, Pete. First, I wanted to say, Sean, that's awesome that you've done 30 years of murelets. Mm. Um, I started Spotted Owls in 1992, so I think I'm uh, yeah, yeah. pretty even there. Um, and it's Rob will vouch that um, I'm a knobball here. I am not a birder. I just happen to be in the bird world. But um, 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 I made a comment in the chat. Um, um, John Hunter had contacted both Alan and myself uh, for uh, things to go in the the atlas, the breeding bird atlas, and. Um, one of the things I, I um, offered up was I saw Clark, Clark's Nutcracker during the breeding season um, up at Bear Hole, which is um, above Box Camp, east of Hoopa. Ooh. And John got all excited because he said there was yeah. no breeding records for Clark's, Humboldt, uh, Clark's Nutcracker in Humboldt. So um, that was back in the 90s. Nice. And was that during the summer, Pete? Yeah. Yeah, there, there's an old the summer, there's huh? an old owl site up there. I went cruising around, calling during the daytime. Or it was, I'd have to look up what time it was. Might have been, more, I think it might have been morning. I went up there, and that's that's you can't get too much farther east in Humboldt than than up there. Yeah, yeah. I've still never been up there. Is that close and, to oh, Salmon yeah. Mountain? Huh? I've been up on Salmon Mountain. Um, so uh, another story I can share from up there was five, well, it's coming up on six years ago, the Hoopa Owl crew had found a hybrid pair, a spotted owl male and a uh, barred owl female, and they had a young. And so I, I uh, collaborated with uh, Mark and his crew and went up there and caught all three. So that that's, you know, that's a fairly unique observation for Humboldt County. I don't know too many hybrid owls banded in Humboldt County. And oh. last summer, the Forest Service found that bird 
it's in Trinity County, but you know, not too far out. The and hybrid? We, went and we caught it and him. So that, was, that was fun. Was that the hybrid one? Yeah, the hy- the hybrid juvenile that I caught in ninety uh, in, in uh, what year is this? <laughs> um, twenty twenty, man. And, and, and in twenty fifteen, <laughs> I, I I caught the hybrid juvenile along with the the two adults, and then that hybrid showed up this year. He was paired with a barred owl female, and they had three offspring. We were able to catch one of those offspring, so the the people doing genetics are pretty happy with that sample. They haven't looked at it yet, I don't think, but they have it. That's amazing. And you have photos of that bird on your Facebook oh, yeah. page, right, Pete? Yeah. yeah. So if you if you're on Facebook and you want to see pictures of that. Oh, and um, and and um, and uh, uh, for people that didn't get a chance to see it, I, I did a talk on the owls for the Audubon chapter. So, Rob, you said. I that. think that that's public. There's. A, I think there's. I a shared link some for pictures it. during that. Mm-hmm. There, yeah, it's it's on uh, it's on their their yeah they have a link to it. Should add I could I could see if they could add a, a target points if people that just wanted to see pictures of the uh, hybrid. I wonder. Thanks, Peter. I wonder if anyone on here or you uh, know what. If, if anyone remembers the very first barred owl record in the area, I'm asking because I don't know. There, there was one um, near Brandon Mountain in the 80s. I want to say like 83, 82. That was the, the earliest that I recall hearing about in Humboldt. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. The earliest California is down in. Uh, He's got the story. Is. Rin or Mendocino, 78, I think it was. G- Gary knows the local story. Well, that's oh, compl- complicated because um, a misidentified barred owl was um, up um, by the, the, the Patterson Ponds there in Willow Creek, but uh, it was, it was, wasn't identified correctly until um, that calling bird was found up in Delnar County at the Hallen Hill camp. Was that, was that 80, 82? 82. 82. Um, yeah, Dick, Dick Erickson was with a, a group, um, uh, a teachers, um, looking at the, the outdoor school there at Hallen Hill. And they were all huddled about in in one of the hollow stumps and um and um they were hearing this bird call and um dick erickson with authority said well that's that's clearly a spotted owl and um he said we could actually call it in spotted owls are easy to call in if you just just repeat the call and Dick, Dick repeat <laughs> mimics the call and realizes right then that he's he's talking barred owl not spotted owl <laughs> and um, so the, he got down to a, a payphone and gave me a call and we got to go up there and then the next weekend the gang from down south McCaskey and all got up to see that barred owl um, but actually, John Brack eventually showed up to experience the first fart owl, and he realized that the bird he was hearing the year before in Willow Creek was was a, a fart owl. Was that a first state record, Gary? That's first state record, first known. I mean, first yeah, first realization that fart owl was in the state. Yeah, it, it, that was so that. I'm looking at Doc's book and it says first report of the region where it saw your in fall 81 then. That was John Brax. Yeah. So that's the one by Patterson. Yeah. That, yeah. I, I think we thought that was the same bird um, that John Brack had that, um, that um, 
he didn't realize until after the fact. <clears throat> yeah, I remember. I remember once. I think it was either 1987 or 88. I was spending the night at the trailhead, you know, down at um, Tall Trees Grove, and I heard. But I mean, barred owls weren't on my radar at all then, and so I I I heard what I assumed was a spotted owl, but. You know, and later it had that real quavering tone, and, and I'm pretty sure it was it was a bard rather than a spotted. Yeah. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, you know, I tried to, to call it in kind of closer, and I, I heard something. You know, come in. Unfortunately, my flashlight decided mm -hmm. to give out, so I had this bird sort of giving me that, you know, real screaming call right above me, and I couldn't see it. <laughs> but. <laughs> very good so it looks like we're we're at 643 right here um and we got mark caldwell's talk coming up around seven um and let me check in with mark here mark are you here i saw you you were on here yeah just want to check and see if any, can you hear do you me? need to practice at all with your screen share and stuff or are you ready to go? Uh, I do want to make sure time? I'm having a little bit of a uh, challenge with uh, <laughs> two different versions of Zoom. Okay. So if, okay. Uh, if that works, that I can make sure that my PowerPoint works. Okay, cool. So why don't we uh, say we're going to stop here uh within the next couple minutes so we could give you at least 10 minutes to practice and make sure everything's good to go and stuff does that sound okay for you yes okay cool um okay so does anybody else have any for comments or uh, anything they want to say any anybody from the audience that wants to uh mention anything um uh, Mark, did you just raise your hand? Is that your? No. Oh, okay. Uh, I think somebody wanted me to mention the talk at 7 p.m. So I'll do that, of course. If you haven't heard, Mark Caldwell will be talking at 7 p.m. Uh, on uh, Humboldt Bay Shorebirds. And he's going to be talking primarily yeah, about um, the surveys that many of us undertook uh, a around various parts of Humboldt Bay. Um, gosh, how many years was that? Mark, how many years was that, by the way, that we did that? Uh, three years. Three years, yeah. And so- Well, um, two years, be talking about three all three years to get it all done. <laughs> yeah. And we did uh, springtime surveys and fall surveys, a couple of winter surveys too. And so he's going to discuss the results for those surveys and how important Humboldt Bay is for shorebirds in, on the West Coast, which is uh, recently declared a world hemispheric uh, site of importance, global hemispheric site of importance. Is that correct? Did I say that right? Maybe somebody could. Yeah, hemispheric. If that's not correct. There we go. Okay. So does anybody else have anything they want to say before we uh, uh, call it good and uh, and move to more than 10 minutes now? Thank you for organizing this, Rob. It was really Don't fun. Don't even see any puffins yet? Yeah, thank you, Jude, for being a part. And thank you, Tom, for being here. And Sean, thanks for being here. And Gary and Keith, thanks for being here. Um, and Frank, who looks like he took off already, he's probably going to go eat some food or something like that. And, um, and thank you so much for everybody being here. And uh, you know, if you want to take a break, Come on back at 7 p.m. and uh, we'll okay. get started with Mark Caldwell's uh, yeah. what's sure to be interesting talk on Shorebirds of Humboldt Bay. Yeah, well, thank you, Rob. So, um, yeah, and just to yeah, thank fill, you, fill some, you know, fill some time. I, I, can, uh, that was one other thing I thought might be fun to mention. 
I remember at what one year, gosh, it might have been the late '80s. I had to fill out a rear bird report for the you know, Christmas bird count for the Centerville count for a black capped chickadee. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it was yeah, it was, I mean, that was right about the time they were just starting to come down to Humboldt, and and so now they're here. Yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, a, that's one thing we didn't really we didn't really get to touch on was status change of yeah. species throughout the years. And black capped chickadee is kind of a a banner species. It is right. But, they uh, now outnumber chestnut backs on that Centerville count. <laughs> God, mm -hmm. that's amazing! Wow, oh, wow, cool. Well, thanks, guys, and uh, I'm gonna. Go take a little break real quick because I got to come back and introduce Mr. Caldwell. All right, and uh, and uh, and maybe I'll see some of you guys here at the talk too. All so, right. So thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Thanks, and, everybody. Uh, remember, yes, you thank you. Um, if you haven't uh, uh, donated to Godlit Days, please consider doing so. And uh, we'll see you all later. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. Thanks, Tony. No puffins. <laughs>